Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, I'll start off with a raffle from El Salvador, my home country, coffee, packed last week. So who can tell me what is the original name of Malaga? Aquí, ¿quién fue? ¿Quién dijo? Ahí está, cafecito. Para usted. I would throw it in the frisbee, but I don't want to hit anybody. <laughs> they sue me in the U.S., I don't know about here. All right, so we'll start off. So my talk is about Alpine JS. So first of all, who here are JavaScript programmers? Who are not JavaScript programmers? Okay, now you can ask those JavaScript programmers for questions, okay? All right, this is me. I was born in El Salvador in Central America, land of volcanoes, earthquakes, gang members, and Bitcoin now. Um, I was imported into the U.S. a long, long time ago, so I'm officially a gringo, and I have actually moved here to Malaga uh, four months ago. So now I'll be a malagueño. I'm a computer engineer by trade. I started this uh, company called Ortus. Um, we do a lot of open source. That has been our focus for more than 16 years. Uh, we also have a, a podcast as well to help people modernize uh, in their industries of all kinds. And of course, now I'm here in Malaga. Uh, this is just a link of our podcast, if you guys are interested in, it's in English, um, but uh, we're gonna be starting actually the Spanish podcast in Latin America, in El Salvador, uh, in January. All right, that's all the promos. What is Alpine.js? Right, it's a lightweight JavaScript framework. It seems like every day somebody sneezes and five frameworks come out. In JavaScript, it's the same, but this has been around for quite some time now. It's very close to vanilla JS. It's declarative, like Tailwind. It is reactive, just like UJS, or React or Angular. Um, it's what we call really jQuery for the modern web, and its focus is very different. Uh, it's very small. It's 15 attributes, uh, six properties, three methods, and it's really, really tiny. Okay, uh, you can add it on pretty much any web application. You don't need a build script for it, you can just add the script, and you can create components on your page on the fly by declaring them using xData. So you can just say xData, and then you can start filling in just like view components, properties, methods, implicit getters, setters, computer properties, etc. And then you can use that reactivity throughout. Here's a button where you can add events on specific locations. You can also declare things that are going to be reacting according to those models and so much more. So we're going to cover a lot of code, actually. So very few slides, but a lot of code uh, in the next few minutes. So, but it's really important to know why this was created. Uh, it was not created by me. I just use it. I actually don't work with them. Uh, his name is Caleb Porcio. And his quote really resonated with me is, I hope you find Alpine to be a breath of fresh air, a silence among the noise. Whoever has done build processes using Webpack or Vite or whatever, you know the complexities that come with it, especially when your projects grow in complexity. Sometimes it, it does not get easy. So why Alpine? So Alpine is small, and it's fast, and it's very focused. Uh, the documentation is really, really good. It's, it also is extensible. But the main points are there is no build process if you don't want. Okay? And then you can just basically start installing and coding and repeating. Okay. This is the, the why of the actual mini library. Okay. And use cases, why, what do we use this for? Well, we have been using it for a lot of legacy applications, a lot of applications that have already been written, and we need to move them into modern times. Um, we can uh, start sprinkling Alpine in different areas and not worrying about build processes in that sense. We can still use it for single page interactivity, right? and it's a great jQuery replacement. Right? So if you want to use your single page apps, then you know, use the appropriate tools. But this tool is focused on that specific uh, requirement. It also plays very nicely with server-side languages like CoFusion, CFML, PHP, Java, whatever you use as a, as a backend uh, server-side language. It plays really nicely uh, with those templating languages. Okay? So we, we really consider it as another tool in our tool belt okay? because of its simplicity and how uh, fast and versatile it is. You can see here a little bit more example. Maybe it's a little small, but we're going to do a lot more code uh, to actually go through this. 
To get started, I recommend a few things. If you use VS Code, there's these two uh, great VS Code extensions, so you can use Alpine. There's uh, developer tools, just like Vue, as well, Chrome, and then Firefox. And I really recommend those resources. Uh, there's an Alpine Day, an uh, online conference uh, that they do almost every year. And of course, the documentation is really nice. They also have components that they are creating. Some are open source, some are not. I really recommend you see them. The, the good thing about them is that he creates screencasts of the entire process of how he actually created those components, which is really great as education. So you can actually start your own components and create your own components. All right, that's it. No more slides. We're going to code. If you want to follow, you can go to this code pen. So it will be live. So whatever I'm coding, you can see. Or if you want to go there and see it, it's there. And uh, the entire training, because we built this as a training for our company. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to be able to go through everything, but you can. Uh, it's right there on that one and this uh, QR code. And you can fork it. You can you know, give us more training. Please com uh, contribute. But you can use it to start and start your adventures with Alpine. All right, that's it. Live coding. Everything goes now. You can help me if I have a bug. No more coffee to give away. So. It will be just being you and being nice. All right, let's see how it looks. OK. So this is the documentation right here, alpinejs.dev. Like I said, very easy to follow. Uh, this is my repository right here on the right that I'm going to be using uh, for my cheat sheet, actually, just in case I make a mistake. Okay. And uh, here is going to be our code pen that we're going to be basically navigating and creating things. All right. So uh, we're going to start. I'm going to start talking about state, or how do we start with Alpine. Uh, in CodePen, I've already configured it with a few libraries right here, um, small JS libraries, small CSS libraries. I add them here so we can do our demo here. Uh, so I can just start coding. So I'll start coding here. Let me make sure that these things are maximized. How do I hide this sucker? There we go. All right. We'll start with the div. Okay? And we started off with one attribute called xData. I have created a component. That's it. Just by declaring that xData, that div now becomes a reusable component. Okay? Inside of that xData, I basically define a, a JavaScript object. Okay? So this is like building my class for my component. I can put properties here. I can put methods. I can compute, uh, get uh, computed setters. Etc. And then I can start leveraging everything inside of this div as the component I want to create. Right? So if I create a variable called hello and say hola Malaga, okay? now I can use it. So for example, I can create a, a little span here okay? and just use another attribute. So now we have learned two attributes, x text, and I can say, OK, hello. Okay? And I have an issue somewhere. Let's see who can fix it. Oh, no, it worked. Sorry, this was from yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Hola Malaga. It's there, see? Hola Malaga. It's kind of tiny. OK, let's change it to an H2. OK, change it to an H2. It looks a little bit bigger. There it is. Hola Malaga. So just like that, we, you know, we, we can start using those properties, and we start working with that state. right? So then we're going to create another kind of little dumb component here. So we're going to add a button here. And we're going to say, when I click this guy, click. I want you to change right, something uh, for the button. Right? And I also want to make the text of the button dynamic. right? So I'm going to make it to x text, so I'm going to make that button dynamic. And uh, I want to track the visibility of that message. So I'm going to create another property here called open, and I'm going to say true. It's going to be defaulted to true. Okay? And when I say, when I click this, I want open to become not open. Okay? And the text that I want to show here, I want to make it dynamic so I can show you that inside of these attributes, I can put any JavaScript expression. So I can say, if open is true, then I'm going to say close. Else, I'm going to say open. Right? So I can use the ternary operator right here. So you can see that by default, it's going to tell me to close. Uh, and I'm pressing it, right? and it's changing state already. See? 
So it's tracking already the name for that button, but of course I, I, I'm not, I haven't told it what to show or what not to show. So I can introduce you now to another attribute called X show, which is very similar to view. Who here has done view before? Right, very similar, right? So instead of the V, it's the X. And then I can say open, right? So just by adding that, now I can say open and close. And just like that, I'm working now with toggles, right? Very easy during the state, okay? Nothing fancy, it works, okay? And that's kind of the initial part of working with a component, right? Anything that has an X data, whether it has actually a JavaScript uh, object in it or not, is a component, okay? Now, it looks a little rough, so instead of uh, X show, I'm gonna give a transition. So here's our third attribute we're learning in our course here. So now we have a little transition. Uh, it's kind of fast, but it's there. Uh, and since it's declarative, we can say, okay, I want the duration to be 500 milliseconds. So just like that, I'm adding these nice little declarative, just like Tailwind. And now uh, our transition now is 500 milliseconds. Right? So, and it has a lot of things that you can do with it to do easements, ease in, ease out, everything declarative. Then you can reuse those components as you see fit very easily declaratively. All right. That's the first, first introduction. Let's talk about nesting. So we always are going to be nesting all of our components, one inside of each other, and how do they talk to each other? Well, uh, very easy right now, if I actually wanted to create an embedded component, right? I'm going to create another component here with X data, right? And I'm going to embed the, what I just did on it, right? OK, so here's this component now. So now I have two components, the parent right here and the child. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move uh, the open stuff into the child. Okay? So I'm going to move that into the child. And I'm going to keep everything as is. And you will see that everything still works. So Alpine is smart enough to track a parent and all of its siblings, all of its children, sorry. And then they will inherit everything from those parents. So it cascades, just like CSS, it's cascading down into those childs. If you want a child to affect a parent, well, you can either talk to those properties or emit events as well. Okay? So very easily, you can start nesting things and passing state between them. Okay? All right, let's do a little bit more on, on visibility here as we're going through this. Um, so we have right now our Ola from Malaga with our toggle right, that we did. We did our transition. But let's, let's do some data now. So let me, let me remove this right now. And let's say we have an array of data, right? And it's going to be empty right now. And obviously, it's, it's a dumb one, but we'll start with it, right? We'll do another div. And it's just going to say, we found some data, right? And of course, we want to activate that when there is some data. So we use our X show. And now, since it's, these are JavaScript expressions, we can just say data.length. If we have some length, then we're going to display that we found some data. Obviously, right now, there is no data. Right? And as I add anything into that array, then it's going to be displayed. Okay? So this gives you the power of the expressions inside. You can get creative. Um, and as you see fit, obviously, try to use encapsulation. Try not to expose things there. Of course, this is just an example. And of course, we need to create the obligatory uh, counter, just so we can see how counters work. So I'm going to create another div right here. Right? And this is going to be my counter. So this will be my data element. I'm going to change this to 0, just so you can see how it can react with multiple buttons. So I'm going to create a button here. And when I click on it, right? Um, oops. There we go. I'm going to do a plus here, minus, oops, minus. Okay, and I'm going to say x on, click, right? And what am I going to do with it, right? I'm going to say data, right? And the first one, I'm going to say plus, plus, And in the minus one, I'm going to say minus, minus. Okay? So um, just like that, oops, not x data, x text. Here we go. There we go. So now I have my counter, right? So very easily, you can start creating these little components and applications. You can see how it works. Right? And then you can show things with that dynamic information. Right? So if I create here another div uh, with x show right, on data, 
right, greater than, let's say, 5, we're going to say this is a big number. Right? So if we get into data being 5, then it's going to basically show this is a big number. Right? So that's x show, the bindings, and everything. But let's introduce a few more concepts, shortcuts. So I like to be a little bit lazy. So instead of x on, I'm going to do the shortcut, just like in view, at. So I can do the same. So I can do the shortcuts. It's a little bit shorter. And now let's you, let me introduce you to another attribute, if. So if is a little bit different. So I can't actually just come in here and say if. Okay? It will not work, as you can see here. It will always show. And the difference is that xshow basically just manipulates CSS properties. Okay? That's all xshow does. With xif, it's different because it actually will inject that element into the DOM. Okay? So this is different. It actually will not exist into the DOM. It will actually exist once that condition is evaluated to true. It will inject it into the DOM. When that actual evaluation is false, then it will remove it from the DOM. Okay? So in order to do that, I have to basically change to an actual template. Right? So once I change into an actual template and I put inside you know, pretty much whatever I want, let's say h and h1 here, this is a big number, okay? Uh, then if, x if will actually show, right? But it's now doing injection into the DOM, okay? So we're seeing five attributes at this point, almost all of them, okay? All right, though that is basically showing things. Uh, let's do actually a little bit more fun stuff. So let's talk about models, okay? How do we actually create models that are reactive and two-way binding so we can react and build kind of reactive applications here. Okay? So first a small example, and then we're going to actually build a markdown editor. Okay? So I'm going to start off here, and I'm just going to say uh, I want to create, have a message. It's going to be empty to default. I want to create a function called to upper that's going to just uppercase uh, the string. So I can just say this.message equals this.message dot to uppercase. Right? That's it. That's all it does. Right? Very simple. Uh, then I'm going to create an input, and I'm going to bind that to the model. So another attribute now called message. Now we are created two-way binding between you know, that property and that HTML control. We can actually display it here if we wanted to as well, just so you can see the actual binding. So here it is. Here's the message. We're going to show the message there. And then we're going to create two buttons to interact with that message. We're going to create a clear, and we're going to create a two upper. Okay. And we're going to create clicks on those as well. So on the first one, we're actually going to say message, oops, uppercase, message equals empty. And in this one, we're just going to say to upper. Okay? And now we can react it. right? I know this is a UI conference, but this really looks horrible. right? So we're going to make it look better. Ah, much better. All right, Luis, there we go. So you can see that now it's binding. And now it's keeping track of the state of that property reactively. I can clear it, and it reacts to it. If I want to do uppercase on it, it will react it everywhere. And that's the whole point of these frameworks, right? To give you life easier. Imagine if you wanted to do that with jQuery, right? You have to actually keep track of that element, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is just brings you that simplicity for you to work and react on those models. Okay? All right. That's the introduction into the models. So, Let's do something fun. Let's actually create a Markdown editor that when the user actually uh, creates something in Markdown, we'll parse it and actually create HTML out of it. Okay? So we'll start off with our model here. And I'm going to say I want to keep track of Markdown code. Okay? The user is going to type Markdown code. And I want to also convert it. So we're going to keep track of the converted code. And of course, we need a method to actually do it for us. Okay? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I have a loaded into my settings here the Markdown uh, parser, which is very tiny as well, super tiny little library. And I can just use it. So I can say, OK, what I'm going to do is that this.converted is equal to window.mark. That's the library. I want you to parse, please, the Markdown. And just trim it just for being nice. Okay? And that's my Markdown editor. And now I can actually create my editor. So I'm going to create a text area right here. Okay. 
So you can see the text area here on the right. And of course, I got to bind it to my markdown. This is where I'm going to track the markdown. Okay. And then I want to create uh, the preview button. So I'm going to create the, not the bot, not the bot, the button, the button. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to say preview it. Okay. And of course, when I click on it, click, I want you to call the preview. Okay. That's that portion. I'm going to create another section right here, and I'm going to say I want to do an X show when uh, we have the converted. So I can just say when I have actually something inside of converted, I want to do something with it. Okay, we'll make it. Uh, we'll give it a class here just so you can see what's going on. Okay, just so you can see the difference of it. Right, and we're going to do here the HTML. Right, and then we're going to do uh, the div here for the HTML. And this is going to be the content. So this is going to be X text, and we're going to say converted. Converted. All right. So if I do this and I start typing, let's say I do here hola from way, way web. I am here. I like. The sandwiches. I love hamon. Okay. There we go. You can see that now it generated them the HTML, right, for me. But uh, there's a problem, right? It's not really the HTML. I'm actually seeing the source code, right? So I'm introducing you to yet another uh, attribute called HTML. So once I change that from text to HTML, of course you got to be careful, right, for cross-site scripting issues. Make sure you sanitize your stuff. But once I do that, I love jamon, and I'm going to say, I love manchego. There we go. Now I'm in HTML mode. Okay. So that's how I built a small little markdown editor right there, really easy with all this reactivity. But if I'm reactive, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm also a little bit lazy, and I ate too much jamon today, I don't want to be clicking on that preview button, right? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the preview button because I find it useless. And I'm going to focus on my model here. Okay? So I'm going to just make some space here so you can read it. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this uh, reactive now. So what I'm going to say is x on key up. Then I want you to call the preview. Okay? And I can do it with uh, parentheses or no parentheses. So uh, when I do that, then um, I can start typing and say, non mancheo, I love payoyo cheese. That one I really like. Okay. And now I built a really dynamic on the fly little markdown editor. Okay. And it can get better. So, what if you are a very fast typer? You know, it's kind of clongy. Imagine if this was actually making an Ajax call, right? How can I make this a little bit nicer? I can basically look and say, at another period, and say, I want you to debounce this for me. You can even choose the milliseconds to debounce. You can even choose how many requests to do. So you're not actually you know, uh, basically sending a barrage of, of fetch statements or whatever to server side if you are doing server side. But in this case, you can see that it'll actually eventually do it by the default of 250 milliseconds. Okay? And then if I wanted a little bit more milliseconds, then you can go here and just add them as you see fit. So a lot of these transitions and debouncing works declarative as you start doing. And it actually is nice because you can read it. And you can know exactly what's going on inside of that component. Okay. So that's the markdown editor right there. Okay. And I'll do one more example, and then we can do some questions here. So we'll do something uh, a little fun. We'll do a, an integration with an API called OnSplash to present images. Okay. So we'll start over again here. We'll do a, a last example here to provide a little bit more bindings and things of that nature. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to search on Splash for an image that I want to present. Okay. And then I want a query, of course, what I want to search for. And then I want to actually have the search operation. right? And apart from the search operation, I want a clear operation to make sure I can start clean. Okay. And then I can say, when I want to clear that one simple, right? I'll just go back to you know, the normal ones. This.query equals that. 
And then on search, I'm going to say, uh, if uh, the, this dot query has length, right, then I'm going to go and talk to the API. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the image to that API. So I'm going to do an interpolation here. And I'm going to cheat, because I can't remember this whole thing. So I'm going to cheat. And this is the Unsplash API. And I just say I want a 1600 by 900. Since we're on the in Wi-Fi here, I don't want to let's go be safe here. right? And I'm just passing in the query and say, give me a picture according to that query. right? And that's it. I, I really have done my, my API integration. So then I want to create a form where I actually want to do the search. So I can say, at submit, I want you to do a search on this form. right? Uh, I'm going to do the input, which is going to be bound to that model called query. So I can actually do the query. Okay? And then, of course, I need the button, right? Uh, two buttons, right? Uh, one for clearing and one for submit. Okay, this will be type equals submit. And the clear, we already know that it's going to be just a click to clear. And then, of course, we need our image, right? So let's do our image right here. The image, and then we're going to do x show, of course, if we do have an image. And then we're going to bind now to a property called source. Okay, So now we're doing uh, property binding to the actual property we want. And we'll add that class so you can see a little bit better. Thumbnail, right, there we go. So I built my little search already. I can go search here for Malaga and submit, and boom, not found, right? So I've submitted the form, actually. An HTML submit. So OK, let's prevent that from submitting. right? So I can just say dot prevent, and then I can prevent it. And I can say Malaga now, and let's see what it comes back with. And it's, yes, an image. And there you go. Now I have an image search into an API in less than the five minutes that they showed me. Whew, sweating here. Whew. But it worked. So let's see if the clear works. Yes. It worked. So the clear worked. And let's search for Argentina playing on Sunday. And did not get the football match. But sure, there we go. But that's a little just introduction, very quick, quick introduction into Alpine and how easily you can get into it and start working with it. It's very easy on our training. Our developers can get started in one day. And then they can move on to you know, more complex frameworks such as Alpine or Angular or React. But this is a great one to start. I really recommend it. But uh, that's all I have. So thank you very much.